Last time we talked about environmental health and ecotoxicology. We also talked about the potential toxins and their physical properties like solubility. We also discussed this thing of the burden of proof versus the precautionary principle. These things dictate whether or not a country deems a potential toxin safe or unsafe. We also discussed zoonotic disease, specifically focusing on COVID-19, the disease caused by the novel coronavirus. And then finally, we talked about movement of toxins through matter. So today we're gonna discuss the atmosphere and climate. We're going to start with a case study that's found in your textbook focused on Florida. This is on page 206. And we're talking about climate warming and its impact on global sea level rise. So climate warming has already caused global mean sea levels to rise about eight inches within the past century alone. Now that might not sound like a whole lot, but what it does do is it increases the height of storm waves and also our tides. It's estimated that by 2050, another 10 inches of sea level rise is expected. And by 2100, sea level is expected to be one entire meter higher than some conservative estimates. So we can take a look at the projected sea level rise, the global mean sea level rise here depicted from the year 2020 where we are now through the future in terms of um, how much sea level in meters is expected to rise. So under business as usual, meaning we don't take any proactive steps to mitigate climate change or reduce our carbon emissions in the atmosphere, we're expected by the year 2100 to see about 0.7 meters in increased sea level. There are also other estimates that take into account some climate mitigation strategies that we can implement, which would further decrease the amount of sea level rise that we would expect in the year 2100. But again, that sea level is predicted to rise. So this rise of one meter is enough to inundate most of Florida's coast, including Miami, Boca Raton, Cape Coral, and a lot of these really um, precious sites like the Everglades and those that are important for ecotourism. So this alarming prediction made the National Climate Assessment of 2014 name Miami as one of the US cities that are most vulnerable to physical and economic damage resulting from human caused climate change. So that begs the question, why is sea level rising in the first place? There are a couple of interacting components that cause sea level to rise. We can split them up into different parts. The first part, which explains about 50% of the sea level rise is called thermal expansion. That's because when something heats up, it actually increases in size. So cold water tends to take up less space than warm water. This is probably a phenomenon that is familiar to you if you boil water and you notice that you have bubbles roiling up and taking more space in your pot. So thermal expansion is one of the things that is explaining our sea level rise. We also have, of course, melting of land-based glaciers and also melting ice sheets. So the melting of this ice either on land or at sea together composes the other 50% of why our sea level is rising. So a huge component of climate forcing is what is happening in our atmosphere. So let's shift focus from sea level and talk about the atmosphere. First of all, let's discuss what it is composed of. So when we talk about the composition of the atmosphere, we're talking about clean, dry air. Clean, dry air is composed mostly of inert nitrogen, that is diatomic nitrogen, N2. About 78% of your dry air is nitrogen. 21% is oxygen, diatomic oxygen, O2. Everything up else is some other gases like argon, carbon dioxide, including water vapor 
something that we might not consider to be a gas, but it's actually extremely important, especially in terms of the greenhouse effect that we'll get to talk about in the coming slides. So this water vapor is simply water in its gaseous form. And it varies depending upon where you are in relation to the poles. Either zero to 4% of the air is composed of vaporous water. But what we also have in addition to those gases are minute particles as well as liquid droplets. Together we call these aerosols. And these aerosols are just suspended in the air. These can come from a variety of different sources, including um, burning of fossil fuels, but also natural sources like volcanoes. So here's a table that's showing the major constituents of Earth's atmosphere today. It's very important to recognize that the composition of our atmosphere wasn't always what it is today. But in today, although this is taken from 2008, we're quite removed from that date, um, but still we have diatomic nitrogen taking up 78% concentration by volume in our air, 21% is oxygen, about 1% is argon. And then here's that water vapor we were talking about. It's really, really, really small if you're at the South Pole, and it's actually quite large if you're at the tropics. And then CO2 in 2008 was 0.039%. But as we'll talk about in the coming slides, this is actually extremely out of date. But let's focus on the composition of the atmosphere and the different layers that we have. So first, what you're probably most familiar with is the troposphere. This is the part of the atmosphere that you fly into when you're in an airplane. We can define the troposphere and these other layers into distinct zones of contrasting temperatures due to differences in their absorption of solar energy. So the troposphere is actually pretty darn cold. If you've ever flown in a plane and you see little ice crystals forming on your window, that's because it's really cold up there. Above the troposphere, we have the stratosphere. That's where hot air balloons will take you. Above that, we have the mesosphere, which is this middle layer. Meso means middle. This is where meteorites will burn up when they are trying to impact the Earth. Then we have the thermosphere. This is where you have the interaction of particles in Earth's magnetic field, causing the beautiful phenomenon that we have called the northern or southern lights. And then beyond these main layers of the atmosphere, we have what's called the exosphere, which is space, and that's where we send all of our satellites into. So the layer that's closest to the Earth's surface, the troposphere, this is where we have our daily temperature changes. This is where wind is happening. And this is where precipitation is falling from. All of these things combined is what we call weather. Let's talk about the temperature shifts that are experienced as you go from one layer of the atmosphere to the next. The first is the troposphere. And this is where air circulates in great vertical and horizontal convection currents. If you're curious, the word tropo comes from the Greek tropin, which means to turn or to change. So within the troposphere, air circulates in these motions and we get these convection currents. So the name actually tells a whole lot of what is happening there. As you can see, going from the surface of about 18 degrees centigrade, as you increase in altitude, you're rapidly declining your temperature. We have, temp we have elevation depicted in kilometers on the left and elevation depicted in miles on the right on this graph. So as we increase in altitude, we are dropping our temperature. And the troposphere actually ranges in depth or height from about 11 miles over the equator to about five miles over the poles where the air there is really cold and really dense. And because gravity holds most air molecules close to Earth's surface, the troposphere is actually much denser than the other layers. And if you were to compare 
the composition of the troposphere to the other layers, the troposphere actually contains 75% of the total mass of the atmosphere. So this rapid decline in temperature actually stops once you reach the top of the troposphere called the tropopause. Beyond the tropopause, you now enter into the stratosphere. You can notice here that we stop declining temperature and we actually increase in temperature. And that is because there's almost no water vapor here and there's nearly 1,000 times more ozone located in the stratosphere than in the troposphere. So this ozone molecule, O3, does a really, really good job of holding in and absorbing solar energy. It's particularly tuned to absorb the wavelengths that the sun is shooting out. So it does a really good job of warming the stratosphere. And that's why we have this progressively uh, warmer temperature as we increase in altitude in the stratosphere. The stratosphere extends about 31 miles out from the tropopause, and it's actually far more dilute than the troposphere, but it has similar composition except for the absence of water vapor and lots and lots of ozone. The stratosphere, unlike the troposphere, is relatively calm and you don't have those churning of winds or convection currents. There's actually very little mixing in the stratosphere. And it's because of that little mixing that when we have these big volcanic events, the volcanic ash goes into the stratosphere and can remain there for long periods of time. So not only is that true for volcanic ash, but also human caused contaminants. They have a long lifespan in the stratosphere. So moving on from the stratosphere, when we increase elevation, we then reach the top of the stratosphere called the stratopause. Above the stratopause, we have the mesosphere. Again, meso means middle, and that is where the temperature begins to diminish again. You'll notice that it begins to decline up until it gets to the mesopause, which is that boundary between the mesosphere and the thermosphere. And then once we enter into the thermosphere, we begin to heat that atmosphere again. So in this region of the thermosphere, there are highly ionized or energetically charged particles. And these are constantly getting barraged with a steady flow of high energy solar and cosmic radiation. So in the lower part of the thermosphere, intense pulses of high energy radiation cause electrically charged particles to glow. And that's exactly why we see these phenomenon called the northern and southern lights. So this is just a, a really detailed schematic of how temperature changes with altitude across the different layers of our atmosphere. So we talked about convection currents and circulation of winds, and there are different parcels of air that are continuously circulating on Earth. We have this spinning planet that creates the major winds that we see, and the major winds are broken up into a couple of different ones. The main ones are the westerlies, the trade winds, and the jet stream. So these convection cells here, the polar cell, the feral cell, and the Hadley cell, they circulate air, moisture, and heat around the globe. Okay, so these different wind currents are formed by the movements of these different convection cells on Earth. These convection cells tend to expand or contract seasonally, but they are always there and they're pretty predictable in where they occur on Earth. So for example, at the equator here, up to about 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, we have what are called the Hadley cells. And these are moving in this direction where they converge together at the equator 
forming a low pressure area where we have lots and lots of precipitation. When we get to 30 degrees north or 30 degrees south in the southern hemisphere, we then encounter what is called the feral cell. And the feral cell circulation meets up with the Hadley cell circulation, creating the area of dry atmosphere because this is a high pressure area. We don't have precipitation in high pressure systems. And that's why across the globe, you have a bunch of deserts that are occurring around 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. It's because of the convergence of the feral and the Hadley cells. Then as you travel further northward or southward in the southern hemisphere, we encounter the polar cell named because it's sitting at the poles. And this is going to convect southward here until it meets up with a feral cell. They will diverge, creating another low pressure system where precipitation is allowed to occur. And the spinning of the planet and its influence on the convection cells that we have and ocean currents, that is called the Coriolis effect. And I'm going to show this video that does a really nice job of helping you envision what that means. If you've ever watched the news during a hurricane or a wintertime nor'easter, you've probably noticed that big storms spin over time as they travel. In the northern hemisphere, they spin counterclockwise. But if you were watching a storm in the southern hemisphere, you'd see it spinning clockwise. Why do storms spin in different directions depending on their location? And why do they spin in the first place? A storm's rotation is due to something called the Coriolis effect, which is a phenomenon that causes fluids like water and air to curve as they travel across or above Earth's surface. Here's the basic idea. Earth is constantly spinning around its axis from west to east. But because Earth is a sphere and wider in the middle, points on the equator are actually spinning faster around the axis than points near the poles. So imagine you were standing in Texas and had a magic paper airplane that could travel hundreds of miles. If you flew your airplane directly northward you might think it would land straight north, maybe somewhere in Nebraska. But Texas is actually spinning around Earth's axis faster than Nebraska is because it's closer to the equator. That means that the paper airplane is spinning faster as well. And when you throw it, that spinning momentum is conserved. So if you threw your paper airplane in a straight line toward the north, it would land somewhere to the right of Nebraska maybe in Delaware. So from your point of view in Texas, the plane would have taken a curved path to the right. The opposite would happen in the Southern Hemisphere. An object traveling from the equator to the south would get deflected to the left. So what does this have to do with hurricane spinning? Well, at the center of every hurricane is an area of very low pressure. As a result, the high pressure air surrounding the center or eye of a storm is constantly rushing toward the low pressure void in the middle. But because of the Coriolis effect, the air rushing toward the center is deflected off course. In the Northern hemisphere, the volumes of air on all sides of the eye keep getting tugged slightly to the right. The air keeps trying to make its way to the middle and keeps getting deflected causing the entire system to spin in a counterclockwise direction. In the Southern Hemisphere, where the Coriolis effect pulls air to the left, the opposite happens. Storms spin around the eye in a clockwise manner. So now that you know about the Coriolis effect, let's talk about the heat input from the sun. Heat input to the earth is actually uneven in its spatial distribution. And this makes sense because earth is of course curved. And we have incoming rays from the sun over here, which means that the rays from the sun are hitting Earth at different angles, depending upon where you're situated. So at lower latitudes, at the equator, where the stream of light is nearly perpendicular to the surface, 
we have the hottest areas. So when the angle of incidence of our sun ray to the earth is about 90 degrees at the equators where we see that, then it is going to be the hottest there. But if you're sitting at the pole, that incidence of light is only about 30 degrees. So it's really, really bent, which means that it's gonna be colder there because we're not getting direct sunlight perpendicular to the surface. And it'll be somewhere in the middle at these mid latitudes where that incidence of light is about 45 degrees. Of the solar energy that reaches the outer atmosphere, about a quarter is reflected right back by clouds and atmospheric gases. Another quarter is absorbed by things like carbon dioxide, water vapor, ozone, methane, and a couple of other gases. The other 50% of incoming solar radiation, also called insulation, reaches the Earth's surface. And most of the energy that reaches the Earth's surface is re-emitted from the surface as long wave infrared energy. Gases and aerosols in the atmosphere can absorb and re-radiate most of that energy back to Earth, which helps to keep the surface warmer than it really should be otherwise. This entire phenomenon is called the greenhouse effect. And we do need to consider that different surfaces reflect energy differently. And we call that albedo or reflectivity. And we'll talk about that more in detail in the upcoming slides. So here's a nice cartoon that puts all of those words into a diagram. We start here with incoming solar energy. Everything here has been normalized to a fictional 100% of solar units. So the incoming solar energy is 100. About half is absorbed by the surface. A quarter is absorbed by the atmosphere and clouds. And up here, another quarter reflected away from the earth by clouds and the atmosphere. So of the 45 that makes it to earth's surface, about five is reflected from the surface back out to space. So the total reflected solar energy is about 30 units. When we get over here, we're talking about the interactions between the oceans, the land, and the atmosphere. So about five units is held up in convection currents. About 24 units is in latent heat in water. Through evaporation, that latent heat is going to be converted into energy in clouds and condensation. From there, that energy can be re-radiated from those clouds in the atmosphere back out to space. And of course, some can be re-radiated from the surface. But what you'll notice here, re-radiated from the surface, our units are actually greater than the 100 that we started with. So what's up with that? <laughs> So that has to do with the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect will trap that latent heat between the atmosphere and the Earth's surface. And so a single parcel of solar energy can actually be absorbed, emitted, and then re-emitted multiple times. So that's why this value is 104 when we started with just 100. So depending upon the albedo, these different locations on the Earth have the capacity to absorb more or less solar radiation. So here we have a table depicting the albedo of different surfaces on Earth. Fresh snow has an albedo or reflectivity of about 80 to 85 percent. Dense clouds can range from about 70 to 90%. Water under low sun conditions ranges from 50 to 80%. But you'll notice that dark soil has the lowest albedo, the lowest reflectivity of about 3%. And so this is <laughs> why you don't wear black during the summer. It's because it won't reflect a lot of that sunlight back. It's better to wear something white 
that's probably the color of snow to bounce back that sunlight to keep you cooler. This can be reflected in either percent or in decimals. So for example, an albedo of 80% is an albedo of 0.8. So here we have different surfaces that you'll find on Earth and their varying percentages of albedo. This is extremely important when we're talking about climate feedbacks because particularly in the Arctic, the more snow and ice that there is, the less heat that is going to be absorbed. But if we continuously remove the sea ice and the glaciers that are doing a whole lot of work to bounce solar energy away from that area, the Arctic is gonna get progressively warmer and warmer and warmer. So I'd like you to explore the albedo of different surfaces in your world by using this albedo app that you can download to your device or cell phone. And there's an extra credit activity that's in this week's folder that you should open up and see if you're interested in doing. It's really fun and easy, and it'll help you to imagine how albedo changes just on campus or wherever you happen to be. So talking about the greenhouse effect, if we did not have the greenhouse effect, the Earth's surface temperature would be about 21 degrees Fahrenheit on average, or minus six degrees Celsius. Instead, what we have is about 57 degrees Fahrenheit on average, or 14 degrees Celsius. The difference is made entirely possible through the greenhouse effect. Thus, energy capture through the greenhouse effect is necessary for liquid water on Earth to be here. <laughs> if we did not have liquid water on Earth, we wouldn't have life as we know it. So we should actually thank the greenhouse effect for keeping our surface warmer than it normally would be. So the greenhouse effect is a common term to describe the capture of energy by gases in the atmosphere. And you all have probably heard about it before, but this is in schematic form what it looks like. So some sunlight that hits the earth is reflected, some escapes the atmosphere as we talked about on previous slides, but CO2 and other gases like methane and even water vapor will insulate the earth, effectively acting like a blanket to keep that heat in. And as you'll notice, it's being emitted and reflected back multiple times. So there are a number of important greenhouse gases on Earth. What we don't really think about too much is water vapor, but a lot of the greenhouse effect that we have on our planet right now is attributed to water vapor. Another one that we talk about consistently is carbon dioxide. And so when this textbook was written, the parts per million per volume was about 390, but it fluctuates all the time. And I can tell you this is extremely out of date. So for current levels, we can go to this website called co2.earth. And from there, you can look at the daily parts per million concentration of CO2. And right now we're sitting at 415 parts per million. We'll talk about why that's so important in coming slides. But for now, let's focus back on that big cartoon that we were investigating. So evaporated water stores and redistributes heat across the globe. Much of the incoming solar energy that we receive on Earth is used to evaporate water and create water vapor. What we probably don't appreciate is that every gram of evaporating water absorbs 580 calories of energy as it transforms from liquid to gas. So globally, water vapor contains a huge amount of stored energy. We call this stored energy latent heat. That's what this is reflecting here. And when water vapor condenses, meaning it returns to a liquid form from a gaseous form, then those 580 calories of heat energy are released. So imagine this. Let's go on a virtual field trip in our brains. 
<laughs> Imagine that you're sitting on a, a warm, sunny beach on the Gulf of Mexico. The sun is shining, but it's winter. <laughs> so the warm sunshine and plenty of water there in the Gulf of Mexico allow continuous evaporation of the ocean water that converts an immense amount of solar energy into latent heat that is stored in evaporated water that's in the clouds above you. Now imagine a wind blowing that warm, humid air north from the Gulf, where you are, all the way to Canada. The air cools as it moves north, especially as it encounters cold air that's moving south. And this cooling actually causes the water vapor to condense, which means we get precipitation. So from that warm, humid cloud that was over your head in the Gulf, now you send it over to your friends in Canada. It's going to precipitate out either rain or snow as it cools. Note that this is not only water that has moved from the Gulf of Mexico to the Midwest, about 580 calories of heat have also moved with every gram of moisture. So you're not only sending water, you're also sending energy that is measurable and has a direct relationship to the amount of water that's there. So this heat and water have together moved from a place with strong incoming solar energy to a place with much less solar energy and much less water. This redistribution of heat and water around the globe is essential for life on Earth. So let's talk about a specific example of moving packages of water vapor and atmosphere. And that is with the polar vortex. So we've probably heard about the polar vortex before. It can bring about extreme cold snaps in places that normally don't see such extreme cold temperatures like Texas, for example. And so climate scientists are trying to wrap their head around why we're seeing such an influx of this instance of polar vortexes year after year after year. There are several hypotheses going around. Um, one of them has to do with how climate change is changing the jet stream patterns, causing more extreme weather events. And this is a tweet that I saw that directly connects how warming in the upper part of the stratosphere disrupts the swirling polar vortex that is normally constrained to the poles. And with that disruption, it then drags that polar vortex southward to North America, for example. So I'm going to play this video that discusses that idea. This is Antarctica. It is so cold that my snot froze. I just got home to the States and it's actually colder here than it was there. And I'm not even in Chicago. The coldest air in decades. Whiteout conditions. 20 to 40 degrees lower than normal. So what on earth is going on? I mean, like literally, what the heck is our planet up to? If the planet's supposed to be warming, why is it so cold? Polar, polar vortex. Deadly polar vortex. vortex. Polar vortex. This polar vortex has dominated the news headlines for the last week, but there's a lot of confusion about what it actually is. To atmospheric scientists, the polar vortex refers to these high altitude stratospheric winds that are spinning really fast up near the North Pole. They try to pool of super cold air over the Arctic. Sometimes it splits in two and that forces colder air south. But this polar vortex has become, well, Polarizing. It's counterintuitive. If our planet is warming, then why is it so cold outside? The trend, even this year, with our cold this year, this winter is still among the warmest ever. It's not negating global warming. There are really only two areas on the whole globe that are colder than normal right now. Everywhere else, for the most part, is warmer than normal. Just because a particular weather event bucks the trend, doesn't mean that the planet on average isn't warming as a whole. And in fact, 
some scientists are starting to argue that this polar plunge is caused by climate change. Here's the thing. As the planet warms, the poles are warming a lot faster than the mid latitudes. So places like the US. So the difference in temperature or gradient between the North Pole and say the Midwest is much less extreme than it used to be. That causes the polar vortex to weaken. And this makes our jet stream, which is at a lower altitude than the polar vortex, weaker and wavier. And that drives our weather in the United States. But this is still a hotly debated hypothesis. I think that the jump between saying that by slackening that temperature contrast from the um, mid latitudes to the pole, that doesn't necessarily mean the jet stream is going to become wavier. It's certainly played out this year, just like the hypothesis says, and last year too. It looks like it's global warming, but I don't think anyone yet has enough data to nail that to the ground. One thing is clear. The scientific community agrees that despite the Antarctic temperatures in the Midwest this week, the globe on average is still warming. But if you are in one of those places that's experiencing record cold, try to stay warm and check out some of the links in the description for more on the science of the Arctic vortex and how to survive the Antarctic.